Remember when you ate your dinner really fast in basic training? All right. So we're going to ask you to expeditiously move through your salad. We'll get the, the main course uh, served uh, promptly, and then we'll proceed to the awards. Enjoy your lunch, please. Ladies and gentlemen, if I may, ladies and gentlemen, again, welcome to the 2016 Dwight D. Eisenhower Luncheon. Uh, we have uh, uh, a great program in, uh, in store for us uh, today. Uh, before, we're going we're to juggle the schedule a little bit, and we're going to ask uh, General Milley and Sergeant Major of the Army Daly to come forward, and we'll do the awards presentations, uh, then followed by General Milley's remarks. Uh, I will take this opportunity so as to save a bit of time uh, to, uh, to just to thank all of the senior leaders who are, who are here. Uh, Secretary Fanning is here, Secretary Caldera, former Secretary of the Army is here, uh, several former Chiefs of Staff, General Reimer, General Sullivan, General Vano, General Shinseki, uh, thank you all very much for attending. Uh, Sergeants Major of the Army, Sergeant Major of the Army uh, Chandler, Preston, and Sergeant Major of the Army Tilly are here as well, and we're deeply honored uh, by, uh, by your presence in this meeting. So thank you all for, for attending. Sergeant Major Tilly is applauding himself. We're very happy. Uh, we're, we're very, very happy for that. He's, he's allowed to do that. He is absolutely allowed to do that as we, as we move forward. Um, there are many, many other distinguished Tired guests categories in, the, in the audience. In areas today. like transportation and service industries. Some predict an entire overhaul in the type of work humans will do in the future and expect robots to be pervasive in our everyday life within just a decade. Of course, we already use robots in the military in a limited way with unmanned aerial vehicles as most commonly known. But the scope of robots in military operations is not yet widespread. And that is likely to change in the very near future. As unmanned fighter bombers, unmanned surface and subsurface naval vessels come online, and we are likely, very likely, to see the increased use of robots in ground operations as the technology matures. In fact, my Russian counterpart has publicly set an objective that one-third of the Russian military, military will be robots by 2020. That's in four years. He may not actually achieve that goal, but his intent and his direction is clear. We are also in the midst of major change in lethality and the proliferation of precision munitions to most nations in varying degrees of quality and quantity. Lethality against fixed and rotary wing aircraft has also advanced significantly in the last few decades, so airspace can be denied even to the most sophisticated and expensive aircraft. Land and sea launch ballistic missiles have proliferated throughout the world, and land, air, or sea launch cruise missiles have done the same to deny either the maritime or air domains. What was once the exclusive province of the United States military is now available to most nation states with the money and will to acquire them. There are a wide variety of technologies developing in synthetic fuels, 3D manufacturing, medicine, human engineering and enhancement all of which will likely have significant military implications as well. And finally, finally, there is the mother of all technologies, artificial intelligence, where machines are actually developing the capacity to learn and to reason. There's lots of ethical and moral issues associated with all these technologies, and especially in their application to warfare, but there's no doubt in my mind that the combination of geopolitical, societal, natural, economic, and technological change is rapidly converging in time and space and will likely result in the most significant and profound change in the character of war we have ever witnessed throughout all of recorded history. And whatever overmatch we enjoyed militarily for the last 70 years is closing quickly. And the United States will be, in fact, we already are, challenged in every domain of warfare, space, cyber, maritime, air, and of course, land. 
So what are the logical implications of what must we do to prevail as an army in future combat? The first thing is to understand the basic likely outlines of that future world. Although we cannot determine the exact environment we will have in 2030 or 40 or 50 or beyond, we can, through rigorous analysis, determine what the world is likely to look like in its broad outlines. There will surely be lots of surprises along the way to the future, but we can get the basics about right to develop the forces and the weapons and the equipment that we need to protect our great nation. And then we have to place the big bets, the big bets in research and development and science and technology, while simultaneously conducting legitimate and genuine experiments with our force designs and our doctrine. And this means to us, the Army, that every assumption we hold, every claim, every assertion, every single one of them must be challenged. War, war tends to slaughter the sacred cows of tradition, of consensus, of groupthink and myopia. The next war will be no different. Those of us or those nation states that stubbornly cling to the past will lose. They will lose that war and they will lose it in a big way. We should think of nothing in the past as sacred except the concept of victory. The structure and organization of our army, both operational and institutional, may change drastically and we must be open-minded to that change. We may not have divisions or corps or tanks or Bradleys. We don't know yet. But we are on a serious and deliberate campaign of learning to figure it out. And I can tell you, we need to figure it out pretty fast. And it's better for us to slaughter our sacred cows ourselves rather than lose a war because we are too hidebound to think the unthinkable. At this point, we can say a few things we've learned over the last year of study that we've done intensely about future high-end war between nation states or great powers. And the first, not surprisingly, is that will be highly lethal, very highly lethal, unlike anything our Army has experienced, at least since World War II. With sensors everywhere, the probability of being seen is very high. And as always, if you can be seen, you will be hit, and you will be hit fast with precision or dumb munitions. But either way, you'll be dead. So that means just to survive, our formations, whatever the wire diagram looks like, will likely have to be small they will have to move constantly. They will have to aggregate and disaggregate rapidly. They'll have to employ every known technique of cover and concealment. In a future battlefield, if you stay in one place for longer than two or three hours, you will be dead. That obviously places demands on human endurance, on equipment. But I can guarantee you the days of Victory Base, the days of Bagram, or other static locations for comfort or command and control will not exist on a future battlefield against a high-end threat. That fact requires a significant change in our current methods of thinking, training, and fighting. Additionally, the battlefield will be highly complex, almost certainly in dense urban areas and against an elusive, ambiguous enemy that combines terrorism and guerrilla warfare alongside conventional capabilities mixed with large civilian populations. Our army for the last 241 years, for two and a half centuries, has fought mostly in rural areas, rolling plains, and open deserts. Yes, we were in Baghdad, we were in Hue, we were in Aachen. But for the most part, it was rural areas, rolling plains, or open deserts. In the future, we're gonna to have to optimize ourselves for urban combat. That fact, and I believe it to be a fact, has huge implications on intelligence collections, vehicle and weapons design and development, logistics, communication systems, and mission command. Can tanks elevate their guns to near vertical? Can UAVs fly down alleyways? Can radios communicate through multi-story buildings? How do we develop intelligence inside underground areas of a city? How do units and people move and maneuver? How do you do target discrimination 
and identify friend from foe from non-combatant. All of that and more will be extraordinarily difficult. Army operations in complex, densely populated urban terrain is the toughest and bloodiest form of combat, and it will become the norm, not the exception, in the future. The battlefield will also be nonlinear and compartmented, and units will have non-contiguous battle space with significant geographical separation between friendly forces. This type of battlefield will place a very high premium on independent, relatively small formations that are highly lethal and linked to very long-range precision fires. Our formations will come under enemy fixed wing, rotary wing, UAV and missile attack on a routine basis. Dominance of the air by the United States Air Force, which the Army has enjoyed since the Normandy landings in 1944, will no longer be a luxury that we can assume in the next war. That means our units are going to have to be combined arms, multi-domain capable. We will still have to fight and destroy land-based enemy units and seize terrain. But the Army, yes, the Army, we're going to sink ships. And we're definitely going to have to dominate the airspace above our units from hostile air or missile attack. This is going to require sophisticated air defense capabilities that are not currently in our unit inventories. In fact, just this morning, a few hours ago, we began to roll out our multi-domain battle concept where all of our army will maneuver in all of the domains to gain temporal advantage, enable the joint force freedom of action to seize the initiative. And we will employ our great mobility. We will employ our advantage in fires, both long range and close. And we will conduct cross-domain fires and land forces will, both horizontally and vertically, integrate all of the joint force in all of the domains. And it will be armies that will be central to winning future wars. Because the enemy anti-access and area denial capabilities and their development over the last decade, land-based forces now are going to have to penetrate denied areas in order to facilitate air and naval forces. This is the exact opposite of what we have done for the last 70 years, where air and naval forces have enabled ground forces. To do that, we're going to have to develop ground capabilities that can see and shoot at very long range, far in excess of what is available today. The sustainment challenges will be significant. Life will almost certainly be extremely austere. Water, chow, ammo, fuel, maintenance, and medical support will be about all that we should plan for. Pizza huts, fast food, mail, showers, and any other comfort items should not be expected on this battlefield, at least not as a matter of routine. And our lines of communication will for sure be contested and probably denied. Being surrounded will become the norm the routine, the life of a unit in combat. In short, learning to be comfortable with being seriously miserable every single minute of every day will have to become a way of life for an army on the battlefield that I see coming. The ability of units to produce or purify their own water and locally manufacture their own spare parts with 3D printing may become a necessity. And if the lines of communication can be open and resupply convoys, will likely be autonomous robots or remotely controlled convoys because they will be the only acceptable risk method of supply that we can get to forward troops. Our strategic lines of communication and ports of embarkation and debarkation will absolutely be challenged. We will have to fight just to get to the fight and we will have to rediscover the art of port openings under pressure at scale and relearn the skills of strategic sea and air rapid deployment to introduce